Hey guys, and welcome to the 50th episode, or sorry, 60th, 60th. I need to learn how to count. 60th, <laughs> an even bigger milestone episode of Edu All Stars. Uh, my name is Todd Nesloni. You can find me on Twitter at Tech Ninja Todd. My name is Chris Kessler. You can find me on Twitter at I am Kessler. My name is Keegan Wade. You can find me on Twitter at Nagik14. And thanks for everyone for joining this evening. We have uh, got a special guest tonight. I also just want to thank everyone for comments, um, ratings in the iTunes store. That always helps out, and we really appreciate that. And this week's Edu All Stars podcast is proudly sponsored by Miami Device. Miami Device is going to be an amazing and really fun two-day conference happening on November 6th and 7th in beautiful, sunny Florida. The lineup of keynote and featured speakers are unlike any other event, which you'll have to see to believe. And until August 17th, uh, you can apply to win your registration and a free night's hotel stay. So if you go to MiamiDevice.org, you can find all the details about the event and how to register to try to win a trip for yourself. And hopefully, I will see you there because I will be at Miami Device this year. And as you listen to this week's episode, we encourage you to tweet out using the hashtag as you all stars. Uh, we'd love seeing all your conversations and what really stuck out to you. Well, I am really excited about this week's guest. We have Jed Dearybury, who is a second grade teacher in South Carolina. He is a top five finalist for South Carolina Teacher of the Year, a GQ Male Leader of the Year, a PAEMST winner, and a Donors Choose Editor. Um, so, Jed, thank you so much for being on with us today. You're welcome. It's good to be here. So, Jed, before we even begin, where can people find you online? Um, you can find me um, at MrDairyBerry.com, um, just my last name, MrDairyBerry.com. You can also find me on Twitter at MrDairyBerry1, and, of course, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and just search for Mr. Dairyberry, and I'm in all those places. <laughs> well, I guess, Jed, the best place for us to begin, like every other guest, is just kind of a little bit about your background and how you got into education. Well, I, I just told this story yesterday to our um, district um, welcome back speech, and um, I actually started teaching a Cabbage Patch Kid when I was about five years old. <laughs> My grandma um, bought me a Cabbage Patch Kid just like she did all of the granddaughters because she wanted me to have one, didn't feel left out. And um, so I started teaching, teaching Eric the Cabbage Patch when I was actually in first grade, uh, and then that just started me on the lifelong journey towards education. Um, I've always been doing something in regards to teaching, whether it be through my church, through my college, where I went to school. Um, um, when I was a senior in high school, I did a practicum at, at a local elementary school and worked under a third grade teacher there. And um, I actually lived in Africa where I did some teaching, lived in the Philippines where I did some teaching. And um, it's, just, it's just been my life. Everything that I've done has revolved around teaching somebody something. So what led you overseas? Uh, lots of different things. Um, at, at first it was mission work, mm -hmm. and then um, the Philippines, it was to help start or help um, run a school for missionary kids. So it wasn't necessarily mission work there, but it was just to run, have an American type school for people who lived in the Philippines um, as missionaries. Would you ever consider going back and working overseas again? I, I loved I loved my time overseas. Um, Africa was probably my favorite. I lived in Senegal uh, for five months. It was a semester project that we were doing, and we I wasn't actually in a school there, but what we did every day was work with the kids and teach them English and teach them just just how to have fun, and it was a great time. Have you always taught elementary school children? Then I have always taught elementary school. Um, well. The past three years, I did start, um, I'm an adjunct professor at a local college here in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and okay. um, so I'm starting that venture um, to teach um, new teachers, and it's been a great experience, but yeah, I've always been in um, primary grades, traditionally. I am certified K through two, and then two through six, um, so I have early childhood and elementary certification. Um, but my heart is for the younger kids. That's why I really love because I feel like building that foundation is so important. Is getting into teaching other teachers something that you're interested down the road that maybe as a full-time deal or? You know, I've been asked that question a lot lately. Um, I, I love my classroom and I love what I do there and it's going to take something pretty spectacular to pull me away from that. Mm -hmm. I'm, open, I'm open to um, whatever may come my way as far as my career path. 
Um, but I love being with the children each and every day, and so it would have to be something pretty spectacular to pull me away from that. So let's talk about you were a, a top five finalist for the South Carolina Teacher of the Year. Let's talk about that process. Did, did it start like most states where you kind of were elected in your school and then you kind of competed in your region and that, and that kind of thing? Just to, I guess talk about that experience as a, as a whole. The way that it works in South Carolina is that you're first nominated by your peers um, to be your school level Teacher of the Year. Um, and then there's an application process for the district. Now, where I live in Spartanburg County, there are seven school districts in our county. So each district elected their own, or not elected, they um, went through the application process and they were judged and scored. And you went through a, an application and an interview process. And so I was selected for my district, which was Spartanburg District 6. In South Carolina, there are roughly 80 school districts total. So then each district submits their district teacher of the year for the state teacher of the year and you go again through an application process they then whittle it down to 25 um, you don't know who those 25 are and then they take those 25 and they make their way down to the top five then when you get to the top five um, it's a, an extensive day of interviews down at our um, in, in Columbia in our capital um, it was a rough day I'm gonna be honest with you it was really? a, it was a long day of interviews um, were they panel interviews or individual interviews? How did that work? Um, well, we were in, each individually uh, interviewed, and there were a panel of eight judges um, from all different areas of, of the state. It wasn't just education. There were some businessmen. There were some parents. The, cool. my fa the best judge that I thought, um, to me, it just um, spoke volumes of the process. They had a college student who was preparing to be an educator. Oh, cool. Um, on the panel, and so I thought that was neat that she got to be a part of that. Yeah, very cool. Um, but as I left the day, um, the interview that day, I, I had a tremendous headache because <laughs> it, <was laughs> it was a very stressful day. Um, I, I felt like I did the very best that I could, and when I went home, I didn't have any regrets. I answered the questions as, as best I could. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't come out on top. Uh, but you know, in South Carolina. We really, really celebrate teachers, and to be in the top five, um, I will forever be known as an honor roll teacher here in the state. And um, there was some some great benefits to being even in the top five. So it wasn't. Oh, awesome. Say what? I said I bet. Yeah, there was um, South Carolina. Um, a lot of people don't know, but our Teacher of the Year program is top notch. They um, we have an organization called South Carolina Future Minds. That does a lot of fundraising throughout the year. It's a nonprofit organization, and they put on quite a gala for us. Um, every district teacher of the year is invited to the gala. It's um, just a very um, um, e extravagant night for teachers. We're just not used to that kind of treatment. Um, BMW here in um, Spartanburg actually um, gives the state teacher of the year a BMW to drive for free. <laughs> Um, nice. For the year, yeah, and, and every time it hits 10,000 miles, you, you get a new one during the year, so they don't wear it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's um, and also the state teacher of the year here takes a year sabbatical um, and tours the state, um, being the, the voice of education around the state. So it's a big honor. That's uh, really cool. That's crazy. And, and the winner gets $25,000, so I hate it. No. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is twenty five thousand um, dollars, and oh. it's run, runners up get ten thousand, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my but God. Our, our state really, we um, we really do a great job at, of celebrating education, and I'm I'm happy to share that with your your show so people can know. Sometimes we get a bad rap in the in the media in South Carolina, and we really do um, a good job of celebrating our profession here. Now, as a teacher, what's one of the things that you hope that children leave your classroom with? Well, every, every day I tell my students two things. I, I tell them always do their best and that I love them no matter what. Um, I think it's so important in, for children in today's world to know that, that somebody is going to be there and care for them no matter what because Sometimes life has a way of twisting and turning, and, and there's lots of uncertainty that comes to the way of a child, um, especially, you know, children in um, schools of poverty. Um, 
I've always taught in a school of poverty, and I want them to know that that no matter what, I will be there for them as long as I'm around. You know, I, I want to I want them to leave my class knowing that there's somebody that cares about them, that that loves them, that that wants them to succeed. Of course, I want them to learn how to read and write and, and those kinds of things because that's what my job is is to teach. But I also feel a strong um, desire to build up that self worth and 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 that self-esteem so early um, in their educational career because if you can firm that up early on in their journey the learning that takes place after me is, is all the more solid so I really work on building a sense of community in my classroom uh, just uh, a, a family atmosphere um, um, with my students you know I love that you bring that up and I think that's such a huge part of being a good teacher is focusing on that part of the aspect as well. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, you're also involved at Donors Choose, yes. which is something that none of our 60 guests have really spoken about. And so can you tell a little, our listeners maybe a little bit more about Donors Choose and what you do with them and how you got involved with that? Well, I could, I could spend the whole rest of our time talking about that. <laughs> um, Donors Choose has literally changed every aspect of my classroom. I started working, um, well, not working, I started um, getting involved with Donors Choose in 2006. My principal came into my room while I was um, housing um, bus students, a late bus. It was like almost 4 o'clock and the bus still wasn't there, so that's very late because we get out at 2.30 and the bus had broken down and, and I think the replacement bus had broken down and there was just, we were sitting in there and the principal said, hey, I heard about this site, I want you to check it out. And it was Donors Choose, and I was like, man, that's too good to be true. Um, but I said, okay, I'll try it out, and I wrote this project for um, a language lab. At that time, I had 18 students, and 15 of them were ESOL students. And I, it was my third year of teaching, and I really needed some materials that I could do more um, language immersion in my classroom. The district provided materials, and we even had an ESOL teacher. But with that level of ESOL students in my class, that amount, I felt like I needed something more. And so I went to Donors Choose, wrote the project, and, and in two weeks, the $1,500 project was funded. I was floored, and I was like, well, that's cool that they funded it, but let me see my materials, and then I'll believe it. I still didn't believe it was real. I, I, was, I thought it was a joke. Um, but sure enough, the materials came, and then a few weeks later, I wrote another one, and it was funded. Um, and just this past week, I had my 100th project funded. And wow, 100th project. <laughs> yeah, 100th project. Um, probably about $25,000 worth of materials over the, the course of the Wow. Um, and um, I, I love the organization because they, I, it's very empowering for me as a teacher. Um, if I have this lofty idea um, that that the budget can't help me with, that I can find people in the community to help me with. Um, since 2006, I've become an editor for Donors Choose, and what that means is when the projects, at, they call us teacher teachers as screeners, and we screen the projects and make sure they are um, ready for to go live, make sure they have the materials that they've requested in the project, because a lot of times um, you're writing the project, and then you forget to mention the materials because you, you have to put them in a shopping cart. So you think, oh, everybody sees my shopping cart, but they don't always see the shopping cart. So you, the materials need to be in the um, body of the project. Um, and then also, um, Donors Choose, I'm also an, an advocate for Donors Choose across the state, and I try to help raise money for other schools around the state as well, not just my projects. And back in um, 2012, when the New York City Marathon was canceled due to Hurricane Sandy. Um, I used Donors Choose as a platform to raise um, funds for schools that were affected by Hurricane Sandy. Oh wow! wow. What I did is um, I was supposed to run the New York City Marathon, and I was in New York City when they canceled it. I was a little bummed, needless to say, because all that training for the marathon, you know seemed to be going to waste and so I decided while I was in New York that I was going to run my own marathon back home the week uh, following when the marathon was supposed to be. I put out um, 
a press release to local media and asked everybody who could to um, give to Donors Choose, a giving page that I set up um, in honor of my run, and I asked local runners to come run with me. We had total probably about 100 runners that showed up at various stages of the race, and in one week's time, we raised thirteen thousand dollars for. Oh my gosh! It was very, it was, it was incredible. Um, you know, when I was laying, I was actually laying in a hotel room in New York City, and I just randomly posted something to Facebook, and within a week's time, it had thirteen thousand dollars. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and that's where uh, Donors Choose nominated me for the GQ Male Leader of the Year, um, and and I was one of five that was. That was on by GQ. It was it was an incredible experience. Absolutely. Yeah, so, let, so let's get into that real quick. The GQ Male Leader of the Year. That that's where they found out about you. That, that that's how that all came about. Then. Well, um, I had I'd been in touch. Donors choose. I'd been in touch with them for several years at that point. But they heard about my story of raising the money for Sandy because I had, I had a giving page, and when thirteen thousand dollars comes in in one week, they they noticed that. I see. Yeah. And, um, they they were just. Um, they loved the way that I had raised money for my own class, but also raised money for other um, schools and teachers who who were in need. Um, and it just they wanted to celebrate that, and so they they chose me to be um, they nominated me for the GQ award. Well, I'll say we've had lots of guests on the show, and lots of people have won awards and those kinds of things. But GQ Male Leader of the Year is probably the coolest title ever <laughs> I've heard. So. Yes, I will tell you, it was it was a night that I will never forget. And my sister um, was able to go with me to the event in New York City, and there were some celebrities there. Um, I do have a picture with Robin Thicke that I think. <laughs> cool. um, Peter Francinelli from the Twilight series was there, and a couple others. Um, it was really I, I was really um, Willie Geist from MSNBC and NBC. He was the um, MC of the event, and it was pretty cool to meet him. Also, um, the sponsor of the event was the Movado Watch Company, nice. and, and met their CEO. Actually, had I was had dinner with him that night, so it was it was very cool. It was oh, a yeah, unique so cool. experience. Teachers don't get that experience. No, for sure. Ever really? I mean, but. No. That's awesome. Let's get back. To, uh, let's get back to donor shoes for a second, because I have a couple questions. Since you've had so many projects funded, if you had any like, um, I've done a couple projects myself, and I know that Todd has done some himself too. But if you had any tips to give someone that's maybe new to donor shoes or to to um, help get projects funded quicker, I know like you know like you can put it out on Facebook and everything, but then you're relying on friends. Is there any ways to like? Um, Increase your exposure, like out on the net, and those, and get like maybe more corporate sponsors that way. Or well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, if first of all, all of the tips, I, I do a lot of presentations about donor shoes around the state. Um, this is my first national presentation about donor shoes, if you will. Um, on my website, mrdairy.com, there is a teacher tab, and under the teacher tab, there is a page just for donor shoes where I have the tips listed there, but. One of the things that I recommend is um, is to keep your projects, you know, four hundred dollars or less. Okay. The larger projects, it take it takes those a little bit longer to fund, obviously, because they need more money. But I think people, um, average people who want to help, are a little bit intimidated by you know a two thousand dollar project. But if you see a hundred dollar project, the finish line is a lot closer, and sure. so you those projects fund a lot faster. Um, another thing is to look for um, organizations and um, companies that match um, funds or um, provide, um, you know, what they call an almost home offer. I'll have the link on my website um, to to the donors choose page where you can actually find specific partner opportunity partner funding opportunities for your state. Um, for example, one of donors choose vendors is Quill. And usually around this time, they will do a 50% match if all of your products in your project are from Quill. Um, Disney does a, a match with any project that's usually usually it's like under $800 for environmental projects. Um, okay. Every now and then, big companies like Chevron and, and um, Chase Mastercard will do a match. 
just um, recently Google has been funding projects like crazy in big cities. They funded every project in the San Francisco Bay Area. So just stay connected. Um, and I use Twitter a lot. I uh, use um, the hashtag donors choose and, and I'll tweet it out. I've had several projects funded because of Twitter. Um, another organization that I work for, and I want to make sure I mention that, is, is um, the Lily Sarah Grace Fund. It's lilysaragrace.org, and it is a nonprofit organization um, that was started by a friend of mine named Matt Badger um, after he lost his three daughters to a tragic house fire um, back around Christmas of 2011. And his organization um, seeks to fund arts-infused, inquiry-based projects that are posted on Donors Choose. If you write the project for Donors Choose and then go to the Lily Sarah Grace and submit your project, if it meets our criteria, which also, you know, the grants, the rubrics, all that information is on lilysaragrace.org, um, then we, as a, an education board for the for the fund, we review the grants and apply the funding to the projects that are um, in line with our vision of arts inquiry, um, inquiry-based learning, that kind of, um, that style of teaching. Um, and we also hope to, in the future, offer professional development. We're actually starting our first um, professional development with the Lewis Sarah Grace Fund um, in September with uh, an elementary school out of Charlotte, Albemarle Road. Um, it's a, a great Title I school there in Charlotte that we're going to partner with. So we're really excited about the, where that takes us. So. Great. But to go back to your question, you know, there's all kind of networking opportunities. Um, uh, one thing that I do is I have a business card um, with my Donors Choose webpage. It's just donorschoose.org slash Mr. And I have that on the business card. So if I meet people, you know, in public, you, you always meet someone who says, man, if there's anything I could ever do to help you. And most of the time they're just trying to be nice maybe. You know, and, you, know you say things like that just to, you know, to be courteous. I'm like, oh, well, great, here's a way that you can, and I hand them that business card, and it's amazing how people connect through that. So you, you just have to have different avenues to be ready. Um, of course, you, I, you, know, you mentioned Facebook and, and asking your friends. I have some great friends who um, wanted to partner with me in what I do for students, and um, a couple of those friends work for Bank of America, and Bank of America matches their employees gifts to nonprofit organizations. So I have a friend who gives me say fifty dollars a month, that's six hundred dollars a year and then at the end of the year Bank of America will match that so I get six hundred more um, to apply to my donors choose. So it's uh, it, it doesn't hurt to put it on Facebook either. Sure, for sure. All right, now switching gears a little bit, you got to meet the president when yeah. you won the PAEMST award. Yes. Now, what was that like? Well, it, <laughs> it was a but well, well, first it was a long time coming. The award, the process started in 2012. Uh, no, 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 May of 2011. It started in May of 2011. <laughs> And so it took a while to get the um, award. Um, I'm the official awardee for 2012, but I actually only I didn't get to go and have the celebration until January of this past year. Or, uh, excuse me, of March of this past year, or this year, 2014. Excuse me. Um, but the experience itself was. I mean, you meet the president for crying out loud. It was incredible. <laughs> yeah. uh, not not many people can say that that you stood in the East Room of the White House with the president just feet from you and then um, single file we got to walk by and, and shake his hand. I've got a kind of funny story that he and I had a, a great personal moment. Some people just went up, shook his hand and kind of kept moving, you know, and as I walked up to meet him, you know, I, you, your, your mind is racing. You're thinking, what am I going to say? This is the president. What do I say? What do I say? And I just said, hello, Mr. President. My name is Jed Derryberry. I'm from South Carolina. It's an honor to meet you. And he said, Dairy Berry, he was like, what kind of name is that? <laughs> he said, Dude, what do the kids call you? And he leaned back there and he was like, hey, Mr. Dairy Berry. He screamed it out. <laughs> and I'm just dying laughing hysterical. Everybody's laughing. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what he calls me. And he said, he said man, he said, I just wish my last name was Dairy Berry. <laughs> and it was probably the coolest moment of my life because I'll tell you, growing up with a last name like Derryberry, 
I got picked on quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> there's all kind of um, fun parodies you can make up with the word dairy berry, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's so, awesome, though. That's such a cool moment that you have that's, that's special for you. It was very special, and, and I just want to believe if I ever met him again, he would remember who I was because of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Maybe I'll get a chance one day to meet him again. So, Jed, when you're having a really rough day and you're feeling really beaten down by things that are happening with your students or with the parents or with the, uh, whatever, how do you recenter yourself and, and bring it all back into perspective? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, well, my life's quote that, that's on the, it's my signature on my email. It says, if I pass through life without making a mark, for what did I live? And it's an Argentine proverb that a parent um, put on a little plaque for me several years ago. And she talked about what a mark I'd made on her son. And, and her son was one of those that was, it was tough. It was very tough because he was a challenging kid and, I, you know, I reflect on that moment quite often, and I know that in those hard times that, you know, what I am doing does make a difference, and even though at that moment that I may want to pull my hair out or, or you know, just walk away from it all, I know that that would not be beneficial for anybody because the work that I do, that all teachers do, uh, it does not grow in vain. Unfortunately, our, our fruit is very slow growing. And we have to be patient um, to wait for it to harvest sometimes. And um, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not afraid to cry in the car on the way home. I'll tell you that. I, I, sometimes, you know, men, we, we're not criers. But if it's a rough day, I'll, I'll cry and get it all out so I can go back in and, and face the day again the, ne the next day. Um, and believe it or not, that helps. You feel better. Um, but the, the quote probably is what keeps me going because I know that I'm, I'm making a mark. And, and impacting students. That's awesome. So thinking back to like last year, like what's one of the biggest things you've kind of learned over the last year? Whether it be inside the classroom, outside of the classroom, uh, let's maybe keep it related to education. Well, I'll tell you something that I really, uh, over the past year, you know, though I won all three of these awards that we've discussed in the last year. Um, and it was, a, it was an amazing time. But through all of these things, I learned that education is so much bigger than the four walls of my classroom. There's so much more to it, and um, like what you guys are doing. I, I, you know, I've just met you, um, a couple of you tonight. I met Todd uh, on Twitter, um, and then I got to meet him in person at ISTE, and I, I've just realized over the last year as I've connected with educators through the Presidential Award, people from GQ, people from Donors Choose, um, people across my state, um, that education is so much bigger and there's so much more out there than we could ever realize and we've got to somehow bring all of us together and I love what, what Twitter is doing, how it's connecting educators across the, the country so we can share those common um, problems, so we can share those common solutions and work together. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of talk about Common Core and stuff like that across the country, but one of the things that I think Common Core did for us, it, it kind of united teachers. All the political aspects of it aside, you know, wherever you're from and whatever people's stances are, um, it, it put teachers all on the same page. And I think that was so important because there's power in that. Because, you know, what's going on in Texas with the curriculum and my curriculum, we... we we, we finally were trying to come to some cohesive units where we could work together. Um, and, you know, just on a personal level, um, in regards to education, I learned that, you know, my job is, you know, it's, it's, it's thankless and tireless sometimes, but there are, there are more rewards than I can count, um, more than not. Um, this year, being celebrated so many times, it was incredible, and I wish that for every teacher, and, and that's my goal, like as district teacher of the year, I'm trying so hard. Our theme this year is celebrate, and I'm going to do my best to celebrate every teacher in our district the best I can. That's awesome. That's great. Now, 
sometimes it can be really hard to motivate your students and get them to do something. What is, what's some kind of methods or tricks that you use to motivate your students? Well, I've, um, I'm pretty insane in the classroom, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'm, I'm just like, I feel on all the time. One of the, um, my biggest role models in education would probably be Ron Clark. I went to visit Ron Clark Academy in Atlanta um, a few years ago, and being down there and seeing the excitement that those people had, and you know, the the school building down there is amazing. All of their technology and their classrooms are amazing. But one thing that I learned when I was there was that the difference between um, the only thing that they were doing that that um, really made it was their enthusiasm and their hype that they brought to the classroom. And I've tried to go back and, and take that to my classroom. Sure, you can have all the tech gadgets and you can have all the cool um, tools in your classroom, and, and, and I've got those, and they make my class a wonderful place. But as with any education tool, it's not effective unless the teacher delivers it in such a way that it hooks the student. Um, and that's so important for us to educators to remember as we have all these cool tech tools. Just because you have an iPad and 40 apps on it, if you don't know how to apply it correctly for the learning's sake, it's, it's null and void. Um, some other things I do, I, I, you know, I'll jump, I'll stand on the desk to teach. I don't, I don't mind standing on the tables to keep them energized. Um, I do have a piano in my classroom, and I write lots of songs and jingles and things like that to, to help the learning process. Um, my kids love to sing, and we're we're an arts and basic curriculum school where I teach, and so there's lots of arts integration into the um, curriculum to keep them hooked. Um, I offer lots of incentives. Um, I use Class Dojo, which is an online behavior management system. I'm sure you guys have heard of it, mm -hmm. um, but it I use that to keep my kids motivated. Um, I love to give those points out, and and they love to get them. Um, and I, you know, I've got, I, I've got, I love my iPads. They, the kids love them. But like I said, I have to make sure it's, um, it's delivered appropriately for, for learning, and not just like a, a tool just for them to play. Mm -hmm. So, Judd, you've been teaching for a few years. Mm -hmm. If you had to go back to your very first year as a teacher and give yourself some advice mm -hmm. based on your current self, what would you tell your first year teacher self? My first year teacher self, I would look him square in the face, and I would. <laughs> You do not know it all. <laughs> um, I think my first year of teaching, I came out of college thinking I knew everything, um, and I I wish um, I would have listened more to the more experienced teachers around me. I had one great teacher across the hall. Her name was Molly, and um, I listened to her, but there was such a wealth of knowledge in that building. Um, Combined, there was hundreds of years of education experience in that building, and I wish I would have listened and and observed those teachers more. Um, and I wish earlier on I would have got involved in you know professional organizations and things like that to build a network. Um, that's what I love about Facebook and Twitter and the social media is that it's helped to build that social network in a way that my PD is constant. I mean, I can get on Twitter at any time of the day and have this professional development and my learning is just growing and growing and growing. Um, and also my um, first year teacher self, I would tell him not to be afraid to mess up. Mm. And by that I mean mess up with the lesson plan, you know, not to be afraid to mess the classroom up. Uh, I think I was so worried my first couple of years that I, that I had to be just right by the lesson plan and if I deviated from it, it you know, I, I was scared, you know, when the administration walked in, if I wasn't right where I said I was supposed to be. Um, I was scared that if the lesson failed, that meant I was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and now, as an experienced teacher, I realize that a failed lesson is only an opportunity to learn and make it better. Um, and I think I was probably a little afraid to be more adventurous in my teaching early on. That's awesome. Now. What is something that you are really passionate about right now? Gosh, uh, everything I do, I'm passionate about. Um, just, oh, that's good. You know, I, it, honestly, I'm I'm very passionate about um, new teachers and helping them to 
come into this career with their head held with their head held high. I think that our the public's perception of public education is so misguided and 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 misinformed um, that I want new teachers to be um, a wave of change that that help that comes aboard with the experienced teachers and helps us to change that public perception. Um, my platform when I was going for state teacher of the year um, just last week I was in a meeting with Governor Haley for South Carolina and and we I've talked to her tremendously a, a lot about um, we have to change this public perception of of, of public education. Um, we are the scapegoats for everything that's wrong in society but when in, the reality is is that we are doing everything we can to make it right. Um, we we we're constantly getting the blame, but we are the heart. We are working so hard, and and there's so many awesome things going on in public education, and the only way to get it out there is 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 if we the teacher uh, have a voice. And so I'm very passionate about that, and and helping new teachers and come on and experience that voice right from the get go. Um, I mentioned that I teach a class at a local college, and one of the first things that I teach them how to do is create a website and create a blog so that they can have a a public voice online to showcase what they do. Um, and not only is it a showcase for what they do, it's a great uh, online resume when they get ready to have a job. Uh, they can direct their principals, their their wherever their schools they're applying for to those sites and so um, you know, I want to help them be very successful in the in our field so that they can begin to change that public perception. I, I talked to Todd earlier this week. He had posted some, um, his school had made the newspaper, his local newspaper, and I had given him some advice that I got when I was a first teacher. And I think it's appropriate for the audience as well. It's, I was, if, when I first joined Twitter, I was out there and I was, I was hearing some negative things in the news and about teachers and everything. And I just kind of posted a question on Twitter, something along the lines of, you know, how do you deal with negative news? You see it all the time about teachers. And someone responded, make make your own news, create your own headlines. And I thought that, I mean, that was like so, it just sticks with me to, to, until today. And I know Todd has already taken that and done, and clearly does that. If you follow Todd on, on Twitter, you, you yeah. see that that happens all the time, which by the way, he was on the front page of the, the Today Show uh, website today. So uh, front page of Today yeah. Show. <laughs> Props for that, but um, yeah. So creating your own news. If you're out there and you're worried about what other people are thinking, make your own news. You know, uh, take your classroom, break down the walls, share your experiences. Just like you were saying, um, blog. You know, those kinds of things are really um, because what, what ends up making the news is scandalous stuff, and we have social media at our disposal to share all the greatness. Exactly. And so I'm going to completely control the narrative and share all the amazing things that my campus is doing. Yep. The, um, I have a great friend who works for a local um, television station, and I tweet him or text him or email him constantly if something good's going on. And thankfully, um, his station is eager to cover that for us. Mm -hmm. They're very supportive of public education. There's another station in town. They won't touch anything good about education. They only want the stuff. You know, I'm, I, I met the president. They didn't touch the story. I was in GQ and raised thirteen thousand dollars. They didn't touch that, but the other station did. And um, I'm very thankful for people who want to highlight what what good is going on because there is a lot of good out there. Yep. Um, you know, I can hear my grandma now talking about that one bad apple that spoils the whole bunch. Um, <laughs> That's what goes wrong so often for us in education, and um, like you said, Todd, I, I love that. Create your own news. I love that. I love that. It's a great, great statement. Chris, that's you. Oh, that's me. Oh, it, thanks, Judd. <laughs> that's a that, yeah. That wraps up the end of the conversation. So we really appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us this evening. It was it's great to uh, to meet you in person and uh, just get to know more about you. So where can people find you if they're looking for you online? Maybe you just give your Twitter handle again and they can uh, find you. From there. Twitter handle is at Mr. Derryberry One, and then I have my website MrDerryberry.com. Cool. And I'll post all the the links that we actually have. For the first time in many, many, many months, I actually took the notes while the interview was happening. So if you see me looking away the entire time, I was typing out the show notes. So I've got links and everything ready to go. I'm ready to hit publish right on the website. And um, so those will be up going forward, and I'll go 
backlog those other ones that I missed over the summertime for being just a lazy bum that I am. So, <laughs> um, ways you can connect with us: Twitter, Edu All Stars HQ is our um, Twitter handle. You can also find us with the Edu All Stars hashtag. And then on the website, eduallstars.com/podcast, you've got all 60 episodes listed right there that you can. Um, search out and find something that may interest you. And then on iTunes, you can find us at just by searching out Edu All Stars on iTunes. So we've got our next show on Sunday, and I you will not be able to watch live. And the reason being is this will be our first show that will not be live. It will be pre-recorded. We are interviewing a recent, or fixing a graduate college, or a recent college graduate named Esten Talavera. He is um, completely blind and has been blind since he was seven months old. You'll get to hear his story and his journey into education and what he's trying to do in the educational field. Um, but Google does not play well, play well with uh, people with sight vision and vision issues. And so he's going to be, we're going to do the interview via Skype and we will record it and then we will post the recording up Sunday night. So check back sometime around 9 p.m. Central Standard Time to see the interview with Esten and then we'll get it uploaded on iTunes. And then on Sunday, August 24th, we have the Instagram, blogging, and uh, Teachers Pay Teachers King, also known as Mr. Kindergarten, Greg Smedley, who will be on at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the 24th of August. And we would also like to make sure we thank Miami Device uh, for being our sponsor. You can find them on miamidevice.org. Go check out the speaker sessions and everything else to see what's been planned because um, it's definitely going to be the EdTech event of the year in beautiful Miami. Um, thank you, Jed, again for being on tonight. It was great having to hear your, hear your story and some perspectives we hadn't heard before, so I really appreciate you giving us some of your time. Thanks for having me.